Well, hello, and welcome back to the Patricia YouTube channel. Today, I'm just joined by my co-host, Marcus Vincent. And I thought we'd talk a little bit today about what we have come to know as staging early Christianity. This tracing of early Christian texts, whether they be canonical, like the New Testament uh, uh, Gospels or the Pauline Epistles, or whether they be outside of the canon, things like Ignatius, the Didache, one Clement, etc. And this idea that we have sort of hinted at quite a lot of the channel, but not spoken about explicitly, that these texts were staged, that their composition happened in several parts, and that there was an intertwining and a meshing of ideas and thoughts throughout early Christian literature and authors, where they shared what they thought, rather than just writing in one block text that was then published to become canonical. And so Marcus and I are going to riff a little bit about this today, perhaps have a good disagreement, maybe agree, we're not quite sure yet. And to begin with, I thought we'd start just with the Gospels. Ah, and can I interrupt you? <laughs> ah, that's great. Yeah, probably to, just to set the scene uh, with regards to the history of scholarship. Because um, in the past, I think, uh, let's say past, let's say 19th and 20th century, um, the majority of scholars, I think, thought that these texts were created um, within communities and, and then derived from communities in, in a kind of organic way into those collections, be it that these four Gospels had been created within communities, so different communities reflected in, in their um, respective community Gospels, just as the letters of Paul have been addressed to different communities, were preserved by these communities, and then somehow, because communities shared these texts, they were read within these communities, and we have some indications that these texts were read in communities like Colossians, then people started sharing and also collecting these texts. And that some kind of an organic process some people have compared it to a snowball process. Yeah, uh, they, they merged and created bigger and bigger collections. So that was one idea. That was more critically seen in, in the beginnings of the 20th century, where people started thinking of reduction and reductural, reduction processes. People like David Trobisch were on the forefront, particularly with Paul, but that also overlapped then into the study and the, the, and, and the vision about the Gospels, that these texts were redacted, probably because Trobisch looked at how letter collections, not just Christian ones, but also late antique ones and antique ones, were put together. And he said most of the time it was the author himself who collected those texts first and brought them together in some form of collections. And then we have these redactors who in stages redact these collections and move on. So these were the two prominent ones. And then according to the fashion of the day in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, uh, when we have the postmodern discourse, people started talking about a fluid text as if these texts had been constantly reworked and remodeled so that, says, as some people say, with every manuscript, so with every copying, these texts were altered sometimes in small ways, sometimes in big ways. And David Parker is my former colleague from Birmingham, um, was at the forefront of this movement by publishing a book which was called The Living Text, as if these texts evolved constant, constantly. Now, in the 25 years, I think it was the 25 years uh, um, workshop, looking back at David uh, Parker's book on The Living Text, they put together another colloquium for The Living Text to celebrate his work and him for right and uh, well, so, however, when I was looking into the published um, collection of this workshop, I discovered that not only David Parker himself disagreed in the meantime that these texts were simply evolving like a living text, 
But most of the contributors actually were quite critical of uh, the old postmodern idea that these texts were simply like a fluid process, like a river, where you can't grasp these stages, uh, Jack, you were mentioned about. And I thought, just to give that background, um, so I think when, when looking at scholarship today, um, they are neither supporting the idea any longer of a organic process, nor of the other end of the scale of having text just as um, a continuum of development. Yeah, and I might add to that maybe that history as well, that um, th there's also another branch of scholarship, which is seeing some revival actually, particularly in religious institutions, that wants to return to a single publication, one text yeah. uh, argument. Now, again, we both see the flaws in that, but that's not to say that in scholarship it doesn't exist. I mean, we think about Jonathan Bernier's book that only came out, I think, last year, where he sought to date all of the Gospels before 70. And presumably then, if they're before 70, they must have been written as one text by their namesake. And indeed, even in the public consciousness, and I think here particularly about the new popular series, The Chosen, which is doing very big business at the moment, they all portray these texts as a single author writing at one time. Or indeed, in the case of Matthew, in the show, they show him walking around after Jesus, writing as Jesus is walking on little tablets. And so we should be aware of the fact that although scholarship has disagreements uh, in, in those two sides, it also has the very conservative romanticism that still is, it, is pervasive and persistent. And actually the general audience who aren't involved in academia still also have that perception that this is how these texts came about. And that can't be overlooked because to some extent, and I think it's equally as important, that the belief of the public, whether they're religious or not, it's as impactful, if not more impactful, than the belief of you and I as scholars. Because ultimately, they're the majority, we're a minority. And that's the opinion that's always going to be the one that is, is given more often, especially if it's in a multi-million uh, uh, pound uh, show like The Chosen. Yeah, and, and so that's, that's, I suppose, is a further addition to that layer of the history of, of scholarship. Yeah, I do agree. Um, and so with that in mind, then, maybe we can now begin to open the book a little bit just with the Gospels and, and begin in a place that I think is one of the most neglected. Uh, and, 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 and Marcus and I have talked about this a little bit. And it's one of the most neglected figures, partly because we don't have his work and partly because he's vague. Uh, and that's Papias, um, a figure that, that I personally place a lot of emphasis on when it comes to discerning this gospel business. Because although we don't have his text, for those of you who aren't familiar with Papias, um, Maybe someone lost it once. I think von Harnack says that he may have found it uh, in, in Poland at some point, but after the war, it's now gone. Um, there is a lot to be said for what is transmitted through both Eusebius and through fragments of Papias about the Gospels. And there's one thing that I want to pick up on, particularly for our discussion. And so Papias says a few things. He says that he knows of a Matthew that was written in his own language. And people call that Hebrew Matthew, although I've always found that a quite difficult term when it comes to uh, his own language, whether that actually be Aramaic um, or Syriac rather than Hebrew. Maybe there's discussion to be had there. And indeed, Curaton, in his uh, uh, founding of the Codex uh, Curatonian, the Curatonian Codex, he thinks that he has found uh, that Syriac Hebrew gospel. Maybe we'll come back to this. Pepys also says that he has Mark in an irregular narrative, which I've always also found really perplexing because the Mark that we have is definitely a regular narrative in so much as, yes, it's not the best Greek and it is sometimes a bit uh, rushed, but it's certainly a narrative, right? It has a beginning, it has a middle and it has an end. So we cannot describe it as anything else. And lastly, in a fragment, which isn't transmitted uh, uh, through Sibius, um, and in fact, several fragments mention that Papias may have written John down as it was dictated from John, or that at least he has some form of Jahannai gospel. And one of the interesting things that I think that, that is missed maybe about Papias, particularly with our relationship with Marcion, is the absence of Luke. We have this triangle of gospels, not like the four winds of the earth, as Irenaeus wants us to have, but three gospels, Luke being the omission. And 
this, to my mind, is, although unhelpful for textual stuff, because we don't have the text, Papis doesn't give us lengthy extracts from these Gospels, is the first stage of the Gospel history. How, Marcus, how do you feel about that? What, what do you think about Papis' role in this journey? That's certainly where I stand. What, what, what's your perception of that? Yeah, it's an interesting one because uh, Papias um, accompanies me right from the beginning of my of my scholarship. Um, when I was a young student, I was asked to write my um, dissertation for the diploma um, on Papias. So I started putting together a bibliography and a commentated bibliography on Papias started in, in the critical scholarship in the 15th, 16th century and thought uh, to continue to the 20, 20, yeah, at the time, the 20th century, um, which was a non-starter, of course, right? Because I discovered um, almost everybody who wrote about the Gospels had to engage with Papias. Um, some people who have written about the Apocalypse, of course, also engaged with Papias because his work is a kind of an apocalyptic work. And um, people who wrote on on First Peter <clears throat> engaged with Papias and so forth. So, cutting a long story short, I um, I limited myself on the work which had been done since uh, Josef Kürzinger, a New Testament scholar who has um, extensively worked on Papias, has written about it, particularly on the question of the Hebrew dialect. Uh, that is mentioned in Papias. So I started putting together the bibliography of the reception of Kürzinger's uh, work on Papias and, and, and across Papias' work. So starting from 1961 to 1984, when I had to cut off because that was the year when I did my diploma. So for these few years, I put together a bibliography which, which was a monograph long. Um, with my comments and, and the topics. So I got a very good grasp about at least the, the scholarship in the 20th century um, on Papias, but also going back on what I did on research in the yeah, beginning of the 15th century. So probably Papias is the, the work I know best, at least from my younger years. At that time already, it was interesting to me because uh, at that stage, we didn't have a critical edition of Papias' uh, fragments. So together with my supervisor, Hübner, at the time, we we did a critical edition with Kürzinger as well. He was still alive at the time. So we did a critical edition, the three of us, I mean, these seniors more than me, um, more helping uh, doing it. And I still remember when we went uh, and had a journey to Bernkastel Kuhs, because the famous Nicholas of Cusanus, I mean, Nicholas Cusanus, the ambassador, and then also the cardinal, who was uh, like myself and probably Jack as well, a freak of old books. Um, at the time, of course, he was a freak of um, and a lover of manuscripts. But quite contrary to me, he loved not only buying these things, but also selling them. So we still have his uh, small... Um, a journey booklet where he notes which manuscript he has bought for which price and then also at which price he has sold them. And then he, he, he was always proud in noting the margin he made on buying and selling a manuscript uh, if he made a profit. So quite an interesting uh, chap. But his library is one of the very few ones that's been preserved as he died. So we still ha have his uh, study and we still have the manuscripts and the books as he left them in his study today. Why? Because he endowed from one of the vineyards that he sold for buying manuscripts, but he put one aside for his uh, time after his death. So he endowed a home for elderly people. And because Jesus lives uh, 33 years, so he endowed it for thir for hosting um, 33 uh, old people in this environment, which looks a bit like a cloister, 
uh, and a monastery, but is in fact still today a running elderly home on on the proceeds from this endowment. Now, that's the place where his library is being kept with these fantastic manuscripts and one manuscript, of course, with the fragment of Papias on John. So that's why I went there and uh, for the first time transcribed together with uh, Hübner in the 1980s, this fragment from Paul, from uh, Papias on John. And ever since I was working on this fragment, because it is an outstanding fragment. Um, it is preserved in a number of, not only in Kuhs, but in a number of other manuscripts, because it precedes John's Gospel in a number of Latin Western manuscripts. Now, it's not an easy text, because the, the, the grammar is so bad. And um, nevertheless, it, when, we, when we made that critical edition, um, we discovered that in the past, most scholars stumbled upon this fragment and never took it seriously because they hated the idea, which was present in the fragment, that Marcion engaged with John in, in a discourse and that Papias was the witness. Now, Papias witnesses, as Jack, you rightly reported, that he was somehow writing down the notes by John when he put together the gospel. But that John also had known the gospel of Marcion and the texts by Marcion, because Marcion in this fragment, according to the witness of Papias, says that Marcus brought, Marcion brought his work to John and that John apparently must have read it because he was opposed to it. Um, he didn't like the antithesis, so he knew the published, well, at least the later, but he knew the draft of the then published collection that Marcin put together. How can, he, how can that all happen, that Marcin has put together the antithesis where he distinguishes his work from what he says are the rough and rogue copies of his work. The rogue copies, as the antithesis say, that were put under the names of two apostles and two students of apostles. So he must have also have known the text by John and that John is unhappy that somebody calls his own work a plagiarism of Marcel's work um, is of course not very nice to John. So this small fragment captures a crucial moment in the making of our Gospels, whereby Marcin seems to have written or put together whatever way, that's something we need to discuss, but must have had put together his Gospel with a preface and apparently as then the same fragment at the end says that he has brought letters, works and letters from Pontus so the fragment captures not only the preface of Marcion, the putting together of a collection with his gospel and with letters, with Paul's letters apparently, yeah, but also the reaction of John, which is, yes, which is a criticism, but it also captures that these people did, A, did not write on their own, B, that these chaps, Marcion and the people who he criticized, like John, were in direct connections. They knew each other's work. So they are not writing independently. This is, this is not a community business where like a snowball things come together. This is not a business whereby the one writes without knowing the work of the other. And that's why the synoptic problem will never in the future, in a thousand years' times with all computer sciences, will not be solved because people wrote in knowledge of others' works. So there is cross-contamination throughout the business. And, and then we have the witnesses. We have people knowing about what's going on, like Papias. So what he says about Matthew, which is pretty critical, because he says, well, yes, he has uh, reworked the order, but what we've got are only translations. 
So whether whether Papias had any knowledge about the Hebrew, the dialect and dialecto uh, ebraidi, as he says, yeah, whether he had a knowledge of a Hebrew gospel, we don't know. But what he's saying is that Mark can be criticized for the order of the texts because Mark has only second-hand knowledge. Actually, it's third-hand knowledge because he says what he has got is what he as a translator of, of Peter got. So what Peter is putting out as sermons, Mark records. So that's third hand, Jesus, Peter, and then Mark. And Mark has got the redactor. So it's a reduction process, if not even a translation process. On Matthew, we have the same thing. He says, Matthew writes something in a different language. What we've got is Greek, right? So what we've got is another third hand product. Though it's an apostle who has direct knowledge of Jesus, what we've got as a product is a redaction and a translation. So in both ways, we have to be skeptical and critical. And then talking about this process with Marcel and John, he has, so he has great knowledge that the products which we take for granted as first century products, that these products are second century at best third handed products. Now, when we looked at how these um, fragments of papiers of papiers have been put together by older scholarship, yeah, Harnag and, other, and others, we have seen that they just rejected the notion that Marcion was in contact with John, and they replaced his name in the editions they did by Celsus or by other people, without one single manuscript attestation on the notion that Marcion is present in this fragment, every manuscript agrees. So there's no point for a, uh, uh, an emendation or a conjecture or for, for writing out Marcion out of this fragment. Yet still, people just either did it or today just div do not give any credit to Papias' fragment. It's interesting because almost every introduction to New Testament studies that deals with Matthew and with Mark will use papers to date Matthew and Mark by stating papers rights in the beginning of the second century. Hence, Matthew and Mark have to be in the first century. When it comes to John, they, are, they are simply ignore it. I had a discussion not long ago with a New Testament colleague. I don't want to mention his name. He's writing at the moment for the last 20 years, a commentary on John. He even did not know about this fragment of Papias. So he was innocent about it. It's not because he's stupid. No, no, or not learned or not read well. On the contrary, it just shows how little in scholarship this fragment has been taken into account. And that's why I I rewrote uh, and, and, and used our uh, critical edition in my book of 2014 on Marcel and the dating of the Synoptic Gospels by making a bigger chapter on this text because the text has just been ignored. Precisely. And, and this is exactly where I came to in my master's with you is I was with, again, another great learned scholar at King's College who was telling me about the dating of the New Testament that you know, Mark 70, Luke a little bit later, Matthew just before Luke, blah, 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 classic Q or Farrah or whatever, one of those hypotheses you want to choose. And then you mentioned to me that the Kurt Alond question is, where did my New Testament go? To which point I went back to this, mm. this other gentleman and said, excuse me, Professor, um, how, where did my New Testament go? He said, don't worry, we've got Papius. And so you say, oh, Great. So I thought, well, I better go away and read it. But as you mentioned, A, he was also unaware of the fragment on John. But in addition to that, I felt slightly that it was a disingenuous defence of canonical Matthew and Mark because Papias is not, or clearly not, mentioning the canonical text that we have. I return back to the irregular narrative of Mark, which clearly is not what we have in the canon, and a Matthew that is definitely not the Texas Receptus in the Greek that we have. So 
when we're saying these are a defense of early dating of gospels, you say, well, they're a defense of something gospely or something that influences the gospels. But again, like this has to be so deeply covered with the pall of ambiguity, right? We cannot claim any great definitive uh, answers here from Papias without finding more of his work, apart from to say something gospely, something yeah, that right. influenced what we get to. And again, when we're then saying, as you mentioned, all of these wonderful, wonderful scholarly learned works on the uh, ordering or dating of the New Testament, they seem to be almost entirely uh, have a cognitive dissonance when it comes to Papias and dating these cognitive uh, and dating these canonical texts. They say, well, of course, Matthew is written after Mark in, let's say, the 80s or 90s. Well, hold on. Who's where have you? There's, there is no firm historical rooting for that externally. Now, you could talk about internal evidence, which I think is always weak because, you know, that classic thing of, well, they knew the temple was you know, not been destroyed or was about to be destroyed. Therefore, it's written in, you know, after 70. You think, well, hold on. If I was writing an essay about church, I don't include the iPhone because I'm aware of where I'm writing. Same principle. And th this this issue seems to me that they'll mention it and then compartmentalise it and then move on with the rest of their arguments. And I don't think this is very helpful. Um, in fact, it's actively unhelpful for then discerning about uh, the New Testament. At which point I then want to reel it back a bit, because one of the reasons I also found Papias so fascinating is because he almost stands alone in this early period as having a knowledge of these Gospels or even having a knowledge of apostolic sayings and traditions. And we've talked about it in the past here when we look at Ignatius in the short recension or Clement or, or, or Barnabas or Diognetus. And maybe with the Didache as a partial exception, but even, you know, that's a, a difficult text. These, these great apostolic traditions that are being handed down, as Papias seems to have, through Peter to Mark, etc., go missing. I thought back to an article I read, an old article, an old article which was written in response to Harnack by Bacon, uh, B uh, Benjamin Bacon. He says that, you know, it's um, in the great controversy between Polycarp and Melito in that period of you know great difficulties, not once is John recognised as a, an evangelist, as someone of the gospel writing tradition. And you think, well, we're led to believe that Polycarp is a hearer of John alongside Papias. We're led to believe that Ignatius of Antioch also knows Polycarp and therefore surely must have been involved in this in this sort of little group huddle. And yet Matthew and John, as the two great apostles, no one knows that they've written anything, or at least if they do, they don't mention it or quote from it. And in the case of Mark and Luke, again, nothing seems to present itself readily, despite the fact that Papias has some tradition here. And so that backs this staging principle then it seems that the idea that we retrospectively apply that um uh, that some great gospels were written and they were always authoritative forever and ever and they were basically canonical in the minds of all christians from papias onwards is actually not just a difficult position to hold but one that's entirely untenable because it's rooted in a fantasy that we have received through early Christian scholars like maybe Eusebius and Jerome and people like that, rather than actual historical data that we have. You see, that's so interesting. When when you look at, and it shows the importance of that fragment, once you are not pretending to know that Papias was writing in the beginning of the second century, because that was always the corroboration for saying than what he mentions is from the first century. So if it's not anachronistic, as Harnack suggested, that Marcion is talking to John, as reported by Papias in this fragment, but if the fragment is a fragment, and if the text stands as it is, then Papias is not writing in the beginning of the second century, but he's writing as a reporter and a witness of an engagement between Marcin and John. Which means 
He's not the loner. He's, he's exactly like Marcin himself, as portrayed by Tertullian. And here I would disagree with Judith Liu. It's not just a fantasy of Tertullian, but it's actually corroborated by Papias himself. So we have witnesses who state that after the Second Jewish War, because that is when Marcion, by all witnesses we have, well, we have quite a number of witnesses already from the second century, and then even from the third century. Clement of Alexandria is one of the foremost and most important witnesses who states that after the Second Jewish War, the first, and, and I'm now quoting, the first teachers are moving after the Second Jewish War to Rome to open Didascalia. And now we have another witness, independent, Rodon. Rodon who writes a work to the school of Marcion, where he reports that Marcion had Didascalia Autu, his own schoolhouse in Rome, after the Second Jewish War. Now, Clement even says, of all these teachers who had moved after the Second Jewish War to Rome, the by far, he says, by far the oldest was Marcion. So he must have been already the authority in Rome in his schoolhouse. Because age played a big role there. Hence, being the oldest scholar who is moving from Pontus to Rome to have his own Titascalion in Rome explains why he has such an authority when he engages with John. I mean, John wouldn't have had any engagement with anybody if it wasn't of some authority, even if he disagreed with this chap. But it, that, that was the exchange they had. So Papias is anything but the loner. There is no information, none, not a single one, of any of these gospel materials before that engagement between Marcion and John witnessed by Tertullian and witnessed by Papias. So that's why when I wrote that book for 2014, I said, well, we have nothing. And it's not just an argument from silence. No, it's an argument from witnesses. We have witnesses plenty from the beginning of that debate when these texts existed. And they existed since the debate happened in the time after the Second Jewish War. I think here we, we actually, maybe the viewers will like this, we meet some disagreement. I, 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 I think that, um, that there's two things going on here. The first is the Matthew Mark stuff, and the second is the John stuff, because they're, they're separately transmitted. Um, we get the Matthew Mark stuff through Eusebius, and then the, the fragment for the, the John stuff, right? And so I think that he is, irrespective of where you date him, and I, I do date the Matthew Mark stuff earlier than I think you would. No, but let me just, let me, let me just interrupt you, because that creates now a, a wrong impression. You are right in saying that the Matthew Mark stuff is transmitted separately, but you have omitted that both Eusebius and this fragment credit the same, the, the information about Matthew and Mark to the same work of the same author. They are both saying that it derives from the five books that Mar that Papias wrote. So, irrespective, I mean, we might we might ask why do we have the separate transmission, but they come back to the same book. So, if if what is being said by Papias about Matthew and Mark is said in the same book, it belongs to the same time. So we cannot say that what we know about Matthew and Mark is in any way or shape or form older from what we know about John. It's all in the same five books on the on the words of the of the Lord. So my issue with that would be that um, I think the separate transmission is important, and I agree that separate transmission doesn't make one older than the other necessarily. In the case of the book situation. I think that to assume that the five books were somehow um, 
again, one place, one time written, I think it's a mistake, right? That no, that's something, I, I, I'm sorry. It's not a mistake. It's the first assumption. It's it's a book which has one title, Logon Kuriakon. We know that it's been in five books. Now we can, we, we, we can hypothesize that this book or these five books were like Tertullian's books, not written in one go, maybe in, in several editions. But now we cannot say, because that is the second hypothesis, if we assume the first hypothesis that these five books were written as staged as Tertullian's books, the second hypothesis would be that the information about Matthew and Mark is written earlier or later. But these are already two hypotheses. And Occam's no. razor tells me the more hypothesis you need for making a claim, the more difficult it is. What I would agree is we have different transmissions, but that's easily explicable because, because Eusebius also gives us some information about John and Papias. And we have other information. The problem with, with that Eusebius has with the Johannine tradition, of course, yeah, is that he is not an apocalyptic chap. He writes in the fourth century and he hates Irenaeus' apocalypticism. His reign of thousand years, he thinks, is, is maverick, is nonsense. That's one of the reasons for him dating Papias as he does. And he's also skeptical about Papias. He says so explicitly because he knows that Papias was a supporter of this kind of an apocalyptic tradition of thousand years reign. And that makes him suspect. So that's why anything about the apocalypse he thinks is not worth reading and anything on the John and stuff either. So there is a good explanation. But I, I don't think we have any hint from what we have to stage Papias' books. We can, we can hypothesize, but there's no, I mean, there's, there's no reason for it. See, I, I, I don't think that Occam's razor is actually that way around. I think that Occam's razor is actually that um, both the research and the writing of text does take time. And so the, even, even if one was to say that the dates were close together, right, it's still not the case that one can produce at pace vast quantities of work. I mean, even look at you and I's work. I mean, it's taken me four years. Now, I appreciate that I'm probably slower than you are, definitely. But it's taken me four years to compile research right. And it's taken you, I don't know how many uh, months, years to compile your Martianite average construction and commentaries, etc. You know, so th these things actually, Rome wasn't built in a day. These things do take time. And indeed, as more information is garnered and learned, particularly in a time when information is not readily available in the way it is now at Google, I, I do think there is an element to say, well, actually, this must have taken time. And even the reception of these would have taken time to come about as well. And just to mention also on the dating of Papias, I mean, again, we must not also admit that um, Eusebius claims that uh, that um, Ignatius and Papias are, you know, fr um, uh, around the same time. You know, he's Bishop of Hierapolis while Ignatius yeah, is Bishop in Antioch. Pardon? Which is not too wrong. No, but that still shows early, right? That's pre master So that's pre the Marcion and John. Well, that's, that's the point. That, not necessarily. It depends. It all depends because you you make. I mean, we, we have the same problem with the New Testament scholars, right? We make one claim on the basis of another claim. So we assume one being earlier than the other is is simultaneous with him. So both are early. The the problem is, and I think we have to start with this fragment where we are said, and that places him right in the times of the 130s, late 130s, that there is an exchange where, where Papias is the witness and the writer. So at least we've got the date, uh, at least a time frame for when Papias writes. What, what makes that fragment, what makes that story more trustworthy than Eusebius's story? Well, because A, there's a reason for it. It's, it's written by the, by the author himself. That's not a second witness 300 years later or 200 years later. So that makes it more credible if we have a, a, a text, a fragment by somebody who, who, who uh, talks about a story which happened in the past. He can't have written it in the future. Yeah. 
But so he can, either either the fragment is not by Papias, then he could be placed earlier. But if he writes about uh, an engagement between Marcin and John, he cannot have written that before Marcin was in Rome. No, and that that I totally agree with. But to me, it sounds more like that both it's a both hand rather than an or, right? And again, I know your your position on the books, but it seems to me likely that um, Eusebius is. Uh, right when he says that Ignatius and uh, Papias are contemporaries in their various dioceses uh, or episcopacies, you might say, and um, he writes then. But then also after Marcion comes to Rome, he also writes about that story then. And although they, you know, they... it's so interesting when when you look at at Eusebius, that's another fascinating thing which I've which has occurred to me, which I haven't seen being written and even noticed by colleagues. Usually, we know Eusebius gives us the empress, which gives him the the, the dateline of his chronology. So we know he, he talks about Trajan, he talks about Hadrian, and then comes what has been written in those times and and what happened in those times. He has the entire book one about the beginnings of Christianity. He has the entire book two about the further development of, of Christian times into the times of Trajan and Hadrian. Hadrian comes in book three. And this is the time, it's exactly in those times where he talks about Papias and where he talks about the canonical books of the New Testament. Now, if and when, in, in the rest of the 10 books of his history, he always talks about the writings of somebody being placed at the time of these emperors. That he places Papias, not as he says, as he actually says, that Papias has written in the beginnings of the times, but he places that exactly in those times where, where he placed him in, in his chronology. So I think even, even Eusebius, you can discern his intention to, to romanticize and to put the writings backwards. Whereas I think, in fact, his, his own chronology, his own layout of his, of his work shows and reveals that not only are, are these people like Papias and Ignatius around mid-second century people, but even the canonical gospels have been put together rightly at that time. Mm. That does bear thinking about you. You have you have stumped me there. There, there. <laughs> no, that, look, that... I'm not, I, you know me. I've, I I don't make claims up. Right? People sometimes say that. That's yeah. far from me. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the evidence and put the evidence in front of us. Right? And then make us believe and challenge what we have believed without these evidence because we have yeah. noticed this evidence it is true that the lack of scholarship on on that chronology of eusebius is actually when pointed out quite interesting and it's also astonishing. surprising um I, I yeah i i would i would still contest that um that there is again a, a world in which these two texts of the fragment and the matthew mark stuff can be separate um, yeah but, but look Book three, the last chapter of book three in Eusebius is the chapter on Matthew and Mark in Papias. It's the end of book three. Forget about the first century. Forget about the beginning of the second century. It's the end of book three. Last chapter. But you have a hard time. I mean, it would be lovely, right, to have him writing in the 110, talking about about things in, in yeah. Then we could move uh, the Gospels in the first century. We could move, uh, as we have done for, for hundreds of years, yeah, we could move Ignatius into the 110s or 120s, all nicely put together. But the evidence speaks against it. But, but you see, this is not always correct. I mean, in the sense of, you know, no, you but he is mostly not correct if it follows his intention. He's mostly correct in his dating. He, he never dates an emperor wrong. He he follows he follows everything we know. So he, so he's not wrong in his chronology usually. No, but he but he but he has he has also received 
uh, famous information, for example, about the Ignatian epistles. I mean, he receives seven. He misappropriates the doctrine of Petri from Ignatius Manaeans three that Origen correctly identifies. No, no, let me let me let me correct you. Even in in Eusebius, the information on the Ignatian letters is correct. He he gives us in the information that there are seven letters. Mm -hmm. So in his times, we have a seven-letter collection. Mm -hmm. Then he, start, he, 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 he quotes from exactly only the three letters. No, he quotes from Spinaeans. No, no, no. He quotes, he quotes Spinaeans by thinking it's Spinaeans. And we know from, from Oregon, yeah, that this text that he associates already because it was associated in his seven letter collection with Ignatius, yeah? He, he quotes from a text that he thinks belongs to Ignatius, but Oregon already states that it's from the Doctrina, Petru, yeah? And not from Ignatius. So the seven letter collection, yeah. he certainly has, and he even gives us references what, what these seven letters uh, give us as a, as a journey of Ignatius. But when it comes to, to, to giving uh, precise quotes, it's from the three letters. Uh, no, I, I don't I know. I, I don't see it like that. I do see that he, he views Spinaeans as as Spinaean, um, mm. as Ignatian. Because because I, again I had this discussion with, with Mark Edwards at the Viva. I mean, you know, Mark had a had a slightly similar point of view to you in that he said uh it's you know he's actually quoting Peter, uh, but um, you know, he, he's only quoting it through Ignatius Smanaeans. So either way, you know, Mark and I still disagree with you. This is that Mark just thinks that Ignatius is quoting the teaching of Peter, and then Eusebius is quoting it through that, but knows its full origins. I don't go that far. I, I still think that he thinks it's genuinely Smanaeans, but I, I still think that either of our two positions are more likely than yours, namely that, um, you know, he does accept this as Ignatius. Because otherwise, why, why quite? Why, I, would never, I would never have a problem to, to, to accept your position because uh, it is quite clear that in the fourth century, at the time of Eusebius, we have a seven letter collection of Ignatius. Yeah. And, and so I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Eusebius, so that's an example though, where I think, you know, Eusebius would have known origin as well and, 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 and known his position on it, on this quote, probably. And I think I think makes a mistake. I think he he either now whether that's a mistake intentionally or whether that's a mistake by ignorance or omission is not the same thing. Um, I think he's more likely to make it out of omission than he is um, on purpose. But that doesn't but, mean. I mean, if if uh, it, it even supports the case that we that we're discussing, because if Eusebius indeed bases his knowledge of Ignatius on the seven letter collection. Then we have got him as a bishop who makes, makes that journey. I mean, if then he takes that, these seven letters as historical. And then the, the only, the only um, disagreement is in, in, in Eusebius's head and heart, right? Between what he reads in Ignatius and puts him, therefore, back into the beginning of the second century. And the fact but he talks about these writings when he, in fact, is in the middle of the second century. But that would explain why he would be at the end of book three. Yeah. Because the middle recension is at the end. Okay. Then, and I suppose then... You you're see? Yeah, you're, you're making your own case. I, I am making your case, aren't I? Yes, I am now making your case. And that's the point. So he still knows, although he talks about him being placed in the beginning of the second century, he still knows, right? That it is second sophistic. It's the it's it's rather the end of the second century, mm. and I, that, this mental leap is exactly what I wanted to point out with regards to gospel. He talks about these gospels when he talks about it about the second mid second century by thinking these texts are apostolic, just what Tertullian and others do. That's the point. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. You, you, you've watched you, you've watched learning unfold in in in, in the space of forty nine minutes, and I think that's really interesting. And I, I would like to see um, some some more research done on on 
uh, the church histories and and the the, the chronology there because I think I think that is important and, and interesting and um, we have a similar case because you mentioned that with Jesus' letter to Abgar. Mm -hmm. He talks about the Jesus' letter to Abgar, not when he talks about the beginning of Christianity and and talks about Jesus. Yeah, he only mentions it there and makes use of it, right? But it comes later when he talks about Abgar again. Um, but it's so important, right? P uh, Eusebius finds documents and then makes use of them, and of course, then talks about it when when he talks about Jesus. I mean, it's, it's the only source he he really relies on. Uh, it's interesting. I think it'd be really interesting uh, to talk to, and maybe this is for next episode, to talk to Mark about this, because it'd be interesting to see where he thinks uh, QN, which was discussed before, is a terrible name for what should be called the MGBOG, um, uh, you know, this pre-gospel. Because I, I, one of the reasons I was so, I'm so attached to Papias and his Matthew Mark business is because of Mark's linguistic stuff on the Evangelion and the the, I don't know how many voices, I think he says two, but we have, I don't want to misquote him here, uh, that he, he can distinguish in the Evangelion. Although, and although I also agree with you that um, because all the texts know each other, creating a language model that can discern between these voices is almost impossible because of the amount of uh, 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 intermingling and meshing of the texts. I do think that when one can at least distinguish two, then you can say, well, th therefore there's two sets of influences that are coming from here. But here, staging, yeah, but, but here staging and learning uh, unfolds life as it happened in the last months and, and, and so forth, because I learned uh, and I, 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 I read Mark Bilby's uh, 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 staging idea of, uh, of Marcion's gospel, um, thinking that uh, uh, the underlying sources to that gospel has somehow been a form of a Logion uh, collection, or Logia collection rather, yeah. Uh, it's a bit misleading that he was mentioning and calling it Q just because it's a Logia collection, but he, he he makes it quite clear it's not the same Q as we are known from the Kloppenburg collection. Anyway, um, but he, he, he thinks that also a, an early form of a gospel like Mark uh, is at the basis, so we have two base collections at the base of Marcin's gospel. Now, I I disagreed for a very long time with that, and I put, I uh, I put it out in 2014 in my book that I believed that Marcin is collecting rather um, oral material um, in contrast to Paul. I maintained that until last year, and even the beginning of this year, until I came across um, in reconstructing uh, the Pauline collection of the 10 letters uh, of Marcion, until I discovered that we have a back reference with, with all criticism, I, I wouldn't have liked to see, but that's what evidence is. Um, it, it is in the text, and, um, and with all criticism of Epiphanius as a source, I do believe that this back reference is genuine. Um, a, not because just Epiphanius gives it to us, but also because I think um, in this particular case, he is not quoting the canonical text, but he is quoting uh, uh, the Marcinite Poland text. And in addition, I think we can even sense a hint in Tertullian's uh, commentary um on that back reference so by all means i had to correct my possession and i've done it already um in this channel i think before and i will make it quite clear now that we're talking about staging that i have to withdraw my earlier position that marcion uh, is basing his gospel writing on oral traditions but if the redactor uses only two collections for Paul. One collection of seven letters whereby this back reference from Galatians goes to 1 Corinthians. Then he had a collection in front of him which was differently ordered from the collection he puts out. And this order reflects rather how then the canonical redaction orders these 
uh, letters again. Whether for traditional purposes, because this canonical reduction knew of an older collection where Galatian was after 1 Corinthians, we don't know. Probably yes. So if a reductor makes use for putting together a Pauline collection by using two sources, a three-letter collection and a seven-letter collection, it is most likely that this reductor works in a similar style of putting together a gospel. And then Mar uh, Mark's observations about the different nature of the sources, the logi on the one side and a uh, kind of a narrative of, on the other side makes more sense. And, and here again, I think it makes then sense to think about two sources which are, and that's our problem, of course, which are entirely lost, except for that rational argument to say, if a redactor makes use of collections in Paul, he makes also collections in um, the gospel. If then, just as we talk about staging and you can see still notions of language with all the mixture and, and the, the contaminations, we still have staged texts. And within these staged texts, we can also sense the, the nature of the pre-stages. Of course, pre-stages become ever more hypothetical and ever more complicated. We, we, we should not uh, mislead our listeners yeah, and, and, and viewers. Uh, what we're doing is, is from that moment onwards, from where we move from a attested text, which we can somehow recreate what I've done with Paul, um, with uh, Mark and Matthias Klinghardt and Bedou and, and Roth have done and previous colleagues have done uh, with the Gospels, sometimes also with Paul. We, we, we are on a, at least a certain uh, secured basis. Now going back and, and try to sense those previous sources makes the job harder and more difficult and less secure. But I think once we've got the secured basis, half secure, I'd say, with the reconstructions, uh, then we can move on going further backwards and think about the pre-stages of these texts. And I would, just to put it plain, I would uh, maintain with you, Jack, and with Mark, that we might have and might find those two collections in the Logia collection and in a pre-form of Mark Wind. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And and just to finish, I, I think that's a really special place because um, one of the really beautiful things about working in collaboration with yourself and Mark and our background colleague, Lance, um, and even with wider colleagues as well, is it showed me the significance of collaboration in this in this um, field? You know, often what we find is, you know, not 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 often, but sometimes we find this quite inward, selfish sort of I'm going to do the work and I'm going to find out things and I'm going to get the credit. But I found that working with you two and other colleagues, you know, I've learned so much. And one of the things I quite like that's just happened in the last fifteen minutes is that I have immediately begun to rethink a, a, a process of, of Eusebius. You have just mentioned how, because of Mark, you have rethought uh, the, the the staging of the Apostolos and the Evangelion. And indeed, you know, we may well have come to those conclusions on our own, but how much longer might it have taken us uh, without that sort of collaboration um, and conversation? And the willingness to accept that is, is huge. Yeah, I, I would say even um, doing it in front of viewers and listeners uh, who then ask us questions and put us on further tracks, I think it is the beauty that these types of works that we're doing, we're doing not to to shine ourselves or to make ourselves great because of uh, whatever fantastic, crazy idea we've got. But um, these texts are so difficult that you need more than two eyes and uh, you need more than two brains. Uh, it is the collaboration that uh, may help us to understand them better and to jointly develop a history. Yeah, 100%.
And on that bombshell, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you so much for joining us for another Patristica podcast. And I ask you, please, please do look in the description for our socials. Uh, I've also added to the socials Marcus's Academia page where you can read so many of his great works for free in so long as you make an account. And he has 30,000 followers now on that, which is bananas. And if you're not subscribed to us, please, please, please do subscribe because it does actually mean a hell of a lot. And until next Saturday, have a good one. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.